Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's always great to visit uh, ICTP. Uh, so, uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, by highs and lows, not higgs and lows of the QCD action, I mean uh, different parts of the QCD action parameter space. Uh, and in order to explain that further, I have to do the customary introduction of what an action is, the QCD action is. So um, in, uh, in uh, the strong interactions in the standard model, we can write a term in the Lagrangian that mixes, effectively mixes the electric and magnetic uh, field of strong interactions, uh, uh, creating, introducing CP violation in the theory that generates an electric dipole moment for the neutron, which we should have measured. And we haven't. In fact, we constrain the coefficient of that term that we write down in the Lagrangian to be 10 orders of magnitude below where we expect it to be. Um, so this has been a problem for um, a long time. And in the late 70s, uh, initially Petsch and Quinn and uh, then Weinberg and Wilczek realized that if they turn theta QCD into a, a, this parameter, what's called theta QCD, into a dynamical field, the problem is solved. That field gets its mass from, um, they call it the axion, uh, and uh, sometimes they call it the PQ axion. Um, that field gets its mass from non-perturbative QCD effects, and uh, its mass is very, very low. In fact, it's much smaller than all, usually it's much smaller than all the scales in the standard model that we are aware of. Um, it's determined uniquely by the coupling constant of the action, what is called the, uh, the decay constant. And uh, uh, for example, at the, at the decay constant close to the God scale of 10 to the 17 GV, it's the action Compton wavelength is several kilometers big. So this is, very, very, uh, this is a very, very light particle. Um, and from the previous relation, you can also see there is a one-to-one -one relation between the coupling and the mass of the axion. And this is the full parameter space. The top axis is the axion decay constant. As you move to the right, the, coupling, the axion coupling goes down. With the, standard, the axion coupling to the standard model fields goes down. So it gets much harder to look for. Uh, and at the same time, the Compton wavelength uh, goes up. Um, for a large part of its parameter space, is a great, it is a great dark matter candidate. And we've been looking for it for many, many years. Um, the strongest constraint so far comes from astrophysics. Um, and uh, in a combination with laboratory searches, basically the parameter space below uh, axiom decay constants of 10 to the 9 GV is uh, already excluded. Uh, the great news is that uh, there is an experiment currently running in Seattle at the University of Washington that uh, promises to be the first laboratory experiment to probe parameter space that is not currently excluded by astrophysics. This is the ADMX experiment. And uh, in the future, um, in the next decade or so, it will probably cover the blue region that you see up there. Um, so this sets the stage for um, uh, the action right now. In this talk, um, I will focus on two different parts, as I said, of the axion parameter space. The high FA of the axion, which corresponds to axion decay constants at the gas scale or above. And I will talk about how black holes can be our tool to probe that, action, uh, that part of the axion parameter space. And the low FA parameter space, where the Compton wavelength of the axion is very small, it's between 30 microns and a few centimeters. And there it can create inter new types of interactions, fifth forces between matter uh, that can be looked for in the lab um, using uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, so uh, black hole superradiance, the idea of uh, probing the action with uh, black holes. I've worked uh, several years ago with Sergei Dubovsky, where we, fled, we, we understood the dynamics of the effect. And uh, more recently, with a couple of students, Masha Bariakta and Singlu Huang, Singlu gave a talk in this conference, actually, about the work that we did. Um, uh, with uh, the two students, we fleshed out the signatures of how this, signature, uh, this can be looked for in the gravitational wave detectors, in fact. The point is that of how black holes can probe the action is that black holes have an intrinsic size. 
And for astrophysical black holes that can, whose mass can range between a solar mass and 10 to the 10 solar masses, this corresponds to sizes between one kilometer and 10 to the 10 kilometers. Now, um, uh, if a particle's Compton wavelength is roughly in that region, the black holes can uh, probe that part of the parameter space, similar as the, uh, uh, to the ADMX experiment. In the ADMX experiment, um, they use electromagnetic cavities whose size is matched to the Compton wavelength of the axion, and then the axion resonantly convert to the cosmic axion resonantly convert to photons inside those cavities. Um, so uh, uh, they can be. So we usually, um, so we usually divide the black holes into stellar mass black holes, the black holes that are products of collapse of stars, and supermassive black holes that are believed to be in the center of galaxies and whose mass is very, very high. It ranges between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. And they grow by accretion. So for the remainder of the talk, I will focus on stellar mass black holes because they are more relevant for the currently um, uh, developing and soon running uh, gravitational wave detectors. But whatever I talk about will also apply to supermassive black holes. Um, the process that uh, probes the QCD axion uh, is uh, called superradiance. And it's also known by another name, uh, also known as, Penrose, as the Penrose process. And it's been known to general people that work in general relativity since the 60s. So in that process, what happens is the following. So if you prepare, so if you have a rotating black hole, there is a region around it called the ergo region where even light has to rotate. So now, uh, because of this process, if you take an electromagnetic wave pulse that you see the little orange, is there? A, yeah, you see this little orange blip here, this wave packet. If you take it and throw it towards the ergo region, towards the black hole, going through the ergo region, but not through the horizon of the black hole, there are trajectories for which the electromagnetic wave pulse can come out with higher amplitude than what it came in. So this is a process that extracts energy and angular momentum from the black hole. Um, uh, two, uh, uh, two people wrote this, uh, President Tukolsky wrote this amusing nature paper in 72 and said, OK, let's repeat the same process by um, surrounding the black hole with a perfectly spherical mirror. In that case, the Electromagnetic, uh, the electromagnetic wave packet that we, uh, sorry, press the wrong button here. Um, the electromagnetic wave packet that we prefer, we throw it back in. Every time it goes through the ergo region, its amplitude gets enhanced, eventually grown exponentially, and at some point the radiation pressure becomes so large that it makes the mirror explode. Of course, we cannot create this type of mirror realistically. But um, uh, luckily, uh, nature has done this for us in uh, the case of uh, massive bosons. So if you have a massive boson in the theory, um, then this particle, this massive boson, can create a bound state with a black hole. In that case, its mass, its own mass, acts like a mirror, confining the particle in the vicinity of the black hole. So it can slowly, its wave function slowly leaks into the ergo region, extracting energy and angular momentum from the black hole. And what happens, turns out this process is more effective when the particle Compton wavelength is comparable to the black hole size. And what happens, what you will see happening is, if you have such a particle for an astrophysical black hole, what you will see happening is the black hole slowly spinning down, and at the same time, a very um, dense cloud of particles created around the black hole in a bound orbit, OK? Um, so this cloud is actually very similar to a hydrogen atom. Because unless you sit very close to the black hole, the only potential you see is a 1 over r potential, is a Newtonian potential. So you can have, in order to describe the dynamics of this cloud and describe its properties, all you have to think about 
is hydrogen wave functions. So you can define a fine structure constant that is set by the product of G Newton, the black hole mass, and the axion mass. And, um, and it's the product, so uh, that we call uh, alpha, and I will be calling alpha in the, in the slides to come. You can describe all these bound states by the three quantum numbers that you are used to hearing when you talk about hydrogen wave and atomic wave functions. The principal quantum number that determines the energy, the orbital quantum number that determines angular momentum, and the magnetic quantum number that determines the, uh, the projection of the angular momentum in the z-axis. And the formula for the binding energy is quite similar, as you would expect, compared to that of the hydrogen atom. The main difference, and what makes the dynamics of the system very rich, is the fact that the occupation number of the levels of this atom, of this gravitational atom, instead of two that you have in the case of the hydrogen, it can be 10 to the 75. Because instead of fermions, we have boson occupying these levels. Um, why am I going back? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, um, of course, not all, not all of these levels can, can cause superradiance. In fact, there is a condition for which of the levels can grow, have this exponential growth, can grow around the black hole. And this is, tell, and this is the, the condition tells you that the total energy of the axion bound to that state, which is the mass plus the binding energy, has to be less than the magnetic quantum number of that state times the quantity omega plus, which is basically the angular velocity of the black hole. This is a kinematic condition. And the best way to understand it, uh, Singlu also mentioned this during her talk, is that um, uh, is through another analog of superradiance, what is initially was called inertial motion superradiance or Cherenkov radiation. So if you have a particle moving faster than the speed of light on a medium, then you have spontaneous or and simulated emission of photon radiation. Here, you still have superluminar motion, but now the motion is the, the angular direction. So the black hole, or for example, Zeldovich worked this out for a conducting cylinder, so the black hole is spinning faster than the phase velocity, the angular phase velocity of the wave that gets to uh, uh, to be enhanced by superradiance. Um, so in fact, not even gravity is special to this. You can imagine that superradiance happens for any, um, uh, for all types of interactions, electromagnetic or other. Um, what, makes, uh, uh, what makes black hole special is that the rate for this effect to occur can be very fast. In fact, the fastest it can be is when the Compton wavelength is the same order of uh, the black hole size, it's 10 to the 7 times the, the time scale for this to grow is 10 to the same times uh, the infall time scale for a black hole, for a, in the black hole. For a stellar mass black hole, this can be as fast as 100 seconds. As you move away from the optimal condition, as the action becomes too heavy or its Compton wavelength too short, then this time scale grows exponentially, while if the action becomes too light and its quantum wavelength uh, becomes too large, um, it goes like a parallel. Uh, uh, but the point is, though, that in principle, even though you would think that this time scale is very slow for black holes, the, if the, compared to the infall time, the true dynamical evolution time scale for astrophysical black holes is the accretion time rate. And the accretion time rate for astrophysical black holes is 10 to the 8 years. So if you compare 100 seconds to 10 to the 8 years, you know you have a lot of time for this effect to happen undisturbed, undisturbed and affect the dynamics of the black hole. So in order to see how superradiance evolves, you need several ingredients. And this is a list of the ingredients. So you need to know how fast it happens, the rate. You need to know, as I said, the dynamical evolution time scale for astrophysical black holes, which is 10 to the 8 years. Um, you also need to know what are the uh, interactions of the field that will be doing superradiance. Turns out if the interactions are too strong, they can, also sh they can actually sh shut down the effect 
But for actions which are intrinsically very weakly interacting, it can also give rise to very uh, amazing um, phenomena like the Bosonova. Basically, when the cloud, when the self-interaction energy in the cloud becomes comparable to the gravitational binding energy, the gut collapses with an explosion of axions and gravitational waves. But I want Turns out, for the parameters, astrophysical parameters, this may not be relevant for the QCD axiom. Um, the signals, the main signals, uh, observational signatures come from gravitational wave emission. And because we're talking about atoms, the first thing you would expect to see is lines. So you have transitions of axions between two different levels of this atom. And the other thing, com the other signature comes from something that's special to axions. So axions are their own antiparticle. So two axions in the bound, in the cloud surrounding the black hole, can annihilate to a single graviton, while the black hole itself, while they are in the bound state, makes sure that uh, momentum and energy are preserved. Um, uh, the uh, superargons also, so before I go to discuss gravitational waves, I would like to discuss bounds that are already been placed in the action parameter space by black hole spin observations. So this is a plot that shows the spin of uh, the black hole normalized to one. Zero is Schwarz's black holes, one is, is an extremal black hole, and this is the black hole mass in solar masses. Whatever you see in blue would be affected, shouldn't, would be affected by an action of this mass of roughly of 10 to the minus 11 EV. And in fact, if such an action were there, you shouldn't find any black holes in the blue region. The data points that you see are in fact measurements. Measurements of masses and black hole spins that have been uh, uh, happening for the past 10 years in a more intensified level with much more, um, uh, uh, with a, a much more uh, uh, robustness in the results. And as you see already, there is one right there in red that shouldn't be there if the action was there. So we can use these measurements, given the properties of the systems that they were observed at, to constrain the action parameter space. And this is what we have done. So this is the, uh, this is, uh, the first ever limits of this action, again from, uh, from astrophysical observations, at the high FA region, at, uh, above, at the decay constants above the, Planck scale, above the GAT scale. So whatever you see here in uh, blue uh, is, appears to be constrained by black hole spin measurements. This is the two sigma exclusion derived from uh, stellar mass black holes uh, as a function of the, this, this axis is the inverse size of the axion decay constant, and this is the axion mass. We've tried to do a similar thing for supermassive black holes, but there the measurements are not as robust, they are not as precise, and uh, the other thing, we don't know much about the history of supermassive black holes. The objects are too few, and we cannot exclude the possibility that in the recent past there was a compact object like a, a black hole or a neutron star that fell in one of them and, um, and uh, disrupted the cloud, the process of superadience. Uh, but uh, uh, bounds are not as exciting as signatures. So um, uh, as I said, you should expect um, gravitational waves emitted from this cloud. Turns out that levels that have the same angular momentum counter numbers but different principal quantum numbers, just by one unit, can be super radiating at similar rates. They can be populated at the same time. So you could, should expect there is enhanced rate of action transition between the two levels. Um, the, the, uh, the, the radiation that is produced is very monochromatic. It's like gravitational wave laser. And the frequency for a 10 to the minus 11 EV action is at around 15 hertz which falls in the optimal sensitivity band for advanced LIGO, which, which starts its science run this September. Um, so, uh, the so the signal strength is, this is a size, the typical size of the strain of gravitational wave that you should expect to see on Earth from a black hole, 
that is close to the center of the galaxy. Um, and the signal duration for this type of signal lasts between one and 100 years. It's very sensitive to the parameters of the, uh, of the system. Um, but the point is, but because actually this duration is very short-lived the, in the lifetime of the black hole, so in fact, um, many of the black holes uh, that we observe um, uh, in our galaxy uh, may have gone through the process of transitions and uh, uh, may not be going through that process of transitions today. So the expected event rates, if we try to calculate event rates, how many events should you expect to see in advanced LIGO, we find something that's not horrible, but uh, you have to be lucky to see it. And the main reason is the signal strength is smaller so that you're only sensitive to black holes that are inside our galaxy. Um, so there are always astrophysical uncertainties. Here the assumptions we made, usually pessimistic, optimistic, and realistic assumptions in our error bars. But still, again, as always, due to astrophysical assumptions, we're talking about a factor of 10 or 100 uncertainty in the factor of 100 uncertainty in the range of the expected events. Uh, the most uh, promising signature of the two is actually annihilations. Um, as I said, annihilations happen because actions are their own antiparticles. Now, uh, the, 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 graviton, the energy of the gravitational radiation that's emitted during the process measures, in fact, the axion mass, is roughly twice the axion mass, with small corrections that have to do with the binding energy of the axion. And it appears at higher frequency the transitions, at around 10 kilohertz per 10 to the minus 11 in the axions. Um, the signal duration, because this process is more slow, uh, is slower than, uh, than transitions, can last for thousands of years. So a black hole that uh, has finished the process of the growth of superradians can still be emitting the signal because the cloud will be sitting outside of it for a very, very long time. So it's highly likely that, as we see, that if you look at, again, plug-in distributions, what is known for the mass uh, distribution, uh, the spin distribution of black holes, and they are distributions as a function of the distance from uh, our galaxy, you can find now that, you can estimate now that you may see as many as 10 to the 5 events when advanced LIGO turns on. Um, which is very exciting. Again, there are huge uncertainties here and they become even bigger than transitions and the reason is that uh, this part of, uh, of, the par of the action parameter space as you see here is for action, this is as a f the events, expected events as a function of the action mass. Um, the, the range where advanced light goes most sensitive is for very light actions, 10 to the minus 12 EV or lighter. And in that range, where the optimal black hole masses are around 30 solar masses. And these are black holes that we don't know many things about. Uh, so uh, to summarize, um, uh, uh, the upcoming advanced LIGO has a great potential to extend the, what we already know from measurements of spins of black holes due to uh, black hole superradians. And uh, there are two things that they'll mention. First of all, the superradians effect does not depend on the axion abundance. It doesn't care if the action is dark matter or, or not. As long as in the, th the particle is in the theory, this process will happen under the right conditions. And also, the other thing it doesn't care, uh, the only thing it cares about is that the particle is a boson, so that you can have the huge occupation numbers of 10 to the 70, 10 to the 75, that give rise to these spectacular signatures. So this tool can be used for the QCD action, but also can be used for any type of action, for any type of photon, for any type of scalar that is in the right mass range and interacts with us, of course, gravitationally, which everything does. So now I will switch gears and go to much smaller Compton wavelengths tiny Compton wavelengths compared to kilometer size, uh, and talk about how actions can mediate interactions in matter. Um, due to the couplings of the axion, because the couple to standard model fields, um, 
if you have a mass, it will generate around it an axion field. Depend and depending on the, um, of, on the type of, uh, uh, of coupling of the axion, it can be, look like a monopole field or a dipole field. So uh, the axion, due to this, the, uh, if you have a tiny amount of CP violation in the theory, the axion will have a scalar coupling to quarks. So that means if you take a, 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 a rock, you can see that it will create a 1 over r potential around it. Uh, the the, uh, the Yukawa, this is a Yukawa for, this is a Yukawa potential because the range of the action is finite. The coupling of the action is a very, very small number. It actually can be anywhere, this coupling constant between the quarks and the action, the Yukawa is 10 to the minus 21, between 10 to the minus 21 and 10 to the minus 27. Just to give you a measure, the Yukawa coupling of the electron to the Higgs is 10 to the minus 6. So this is a tiny, tiny number. Um, the other type of interaction the axion can have is a pseudoscalar interaction, which is natural to its nature. And uh, that coupling uh, generates a dipole potential, which now drops like 1 over r squared. Uh, but for this potential, the coupling constant is much larger. It's 10 to the minus 9 for, uh, for nuclear spins. So how do you look for this? Um, now, if you take, so the strategy is the following. It comes from the observation that if I take a spin, a nuclear spin, and place it next to a mass of n nucleons or n spins, all polarized in the same direction, there is an interaction energy. The, this, this spin will feel an interaction energy that's proportional to the gradient of the action field times the spin. And of course, it depends on the strength of the coupling of the action to the spin. Uh, so if you look at it closely, you can actually, by dividing and multiplying with the magnetic moment of the axion, you can rewrite it as a coupling between the magnetic moment of the fermion and an anomalous magnetic field, a magnetic field generated by the axion. Uh, this magnetic field is quite special. It's nothing like electromagnetic uh, fields. First of all, it's very different between nuclei, uh, nucleons, and uh, electrons. In fact, as you see here, it goes, it's inversely proportional to the mass. Uh, so when you divide and multiply, it, it's inversely proportional to the magnetic moment, as you see here. So the effective magnetic field that you measure is, in fact, a thousand times bigger for nucleons than it is for electrons. And because the this is an anomalous magnetic field, as I said. It doesn't couple to the motion of charges. It only couples to spin. So for that reason, it cannot be screened. You cannot use the moment you try to screen my ordinary magnetic fields is usually screened by currents on magnetic shielding. But here, this, uh, this field will not be screened. Um, so we can actually use even these tiny fields. We can use precision magnetometry to detect it. And by precision magnetometry, magnetometry, in this case, I mean nuclear magnetic resonance. So uh, the way uh, NMR works is that if you take a big magnetic field and you have a spin in it, the up state and the down state orientation of the spin will be split in energy that's proportional to the magnitude of the B field. So if I apply perturbation to the system that reson that's resonant, to the energy splitting between the two, these two levels, I can cause um, coher I can cause transitions, resonant transitions of uh, of the of the spins from pointing up to down and vice versa. Uh, in the classical picture, the way it looks is the following. So this is a picture that I stole from uh, Wikipedia. So you have a B field, and in the classical picture, there's a huge magnetic moment that rotates processes around the B field. Now, if I spy, spy, apply a small perturbation in the perpendicular direction, you see that the magnetic moments, and it's on resonance, the magnetic moments want to process around this new perturbation. This is the classic analog of the transition between spins up, spins up and down. Uh, so now, the way it works, I have a bunch of spins that are sitting in an external field setting this external field sets a resonant frequency, and I take a mass that I oscillate to the resonant frequency of the system. 
And what will happen is, oh, is this. As the mass oscillates on resonance, the spins in the sample will start processing um, away from the plane, and I can pick the signal up uh, with a squid. So the size of the signal that the squid pick up, uh, picks up is, is proportional to the density of spins, the magne their magnetic moment, and grows to the coherence time of, of, uh, of the precession of the spins, which is known as uh, the spin relaxation time, or T2. Um, uh, based on this idea, we designed an experiment, and there is currently an experimental collaboration um, that's building uh, this experiment. Uh, where it's going to be based, we don't know yet, because the collaboration is between Stanford, the University of Nevada, uh, Indiana, and Korea. And this is how it looks like. This is the, instead of vibrating mass, we have a rotating mass with teeth. Uh, the, the NMR sample is helium-3 because they have great, very long relaxation times. And this is the squid pickup loop. Um, the effective axial magnetic field that's created is perpendicular. The, the spins are oriented in this direction. And the sensitivity of the sample for reasonable parameters is 10 to the minus 19 Tesla. Just to give you a measure, uh, the the best squids right now are sensitive at a level of 10 to the minus 16 tesla. So in the process of trying to detect the action, we also created a very sensitive magnetometer. Um, this is the parameters. This is an actual two-size drawing of the experiment. And these are the parameters. Uh, uh, who cares? The first version of the experiment will be the source mass will be made out of tungsten, which is very dense, very heavy, unpolarized uh, matter. Um, but the next version will also use polarized source masses. The bottom line is this, though, that the, even the first version of the experiment will have great reach in the action parameter space. So this is the product of the monopole coupling, the, 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 cap, the coupling that couples the action to our source mass times the coupling of the action to the spins, the helium-3 spins, um, as a function of the range of the action. Um, here you see in this in this gray-blue band, this is the action parameter space. Um, uh, up here, there's, uh, this is the parameter space that's excluded by combination of astrophysical and experimental bounds. And even the first version of the experiment will improve on these bounds. Uh, compared to what we've done now in the laboratory, it can be out, up to eight orders of magnitude. And eventually, by increasing the, um, by increasing the the spin density of the sample and, the, um, uh, and using a larger NMR sample will be probe, able to probe deep in the QCD action parameter space. This is, these are similar plots uh, for nucleon nucleon interactions if the source mass has a polarization in spin. Um, and you see here the first version will be roughly the same. It doesn't show here very well, but it will be roughly the same to astroph comparable to astrophysical bounds but eventually we'll be able to probe the spin-spin interaction of the axon up, up to the K constants up to a few times 10 to the 10 GV. Um, I don't have time to talk about system, uh, systematics, so uh, uh, they seem to be OK. Uh, uh, I didn't talk about this, but this is also a technique that can be used to look for um, dark photons. Uh, but we never sat down to work out what the reach is for that experiment. It's the mathematics are also slightly different. Uh, and the bottom line is this, that it looks like even though right now the parameter space of the QCD action means, uh, seems sparse, in the next decade or so, there are several experiments, both from astrophysics and in the lab, that promise to cover almost all of the parameter space other than a little blip right here which actually there are no good ideas for. So, <laughs> thank you. I stop. <laughs> so in the first part that you were talking about black holes, yeah. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, in this um, Penrose process, the end point of the process is where you get an extremal black hole. So you cannot... Oh. Ex 
What do so you the mean? Penrose process stops when you get an extreme of black hole? No, it doesn't stop. It stops when, when you have extracted enough spin that you no longer satisfy the superradiance condition. It's not an extremal black hole. For this process, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean when you, are you thinking the process where you actually throw a particle in and then what is the maximum energy you yeah, can but, extract? But uh, what I'm saying is, is ir irrespective of the yeah, details of the dynamics. Yeah, I don't think that dynamics. what you say is not, it's, not it's not true. When you have an extremal black hole, you can still extract energy. You can extract as much spin. It happens this, if you are in the right parameters. You will no longer extract spin when you, when you have dropped the, 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 the angular momentum enough. That's it. This is where it stops. Okay, we, we can discuss it later. Uh, but uh, do, do you need to consider the back reaction of the axiom, the energy that you have extracted on the dynamics of the black hole? You didn't consider it? Uh, yes, we think it's very small. The bottom line is that you can, uh, you, can see, um, you can see from the fact that the annihilation process, which is in fact in a nonlinear process, what you talk about is nonlinearities. In fact, we think for, for most of the parameter space, it's not an issue. That's the bottom line. Uh, in fact, if you want to look at all the energy levels and do them properly, when you do, when you full, do numerical, all full numerical simulations of the thing, you have to take them into account. But we don't think they're going to be a problem in, in stopping the effect. Okay, so we have time for one quick question here. Uh, another question for the super radiance on, on black holes. Um, for the gravitational wave signals in that regime, do you know, are there any significant astrophysical backgrounds in that so, regime? So actually, I don't think there are. In fact, there's a signature though that can mimic this. This is mountains or neutron stars. So because neutron stars are, 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 are rotating with a very constant speed, so the signal they produce, the, the anisotropies of a neutron star would produce is very monochromatic. But there are several things that can, I mean, um, first, for, um, turns out, so neutron stars usually spin down. This would look like spinning up. Because as the cloud empties out, you, you, you are less bound. So as you are less bound, the energy of the emitted radiation goes up because it's twice the action mass minus the binding energy. So you see it spinning up. The other thing is that um, the amplitude modulates with time, but that's hard to see. Uh, uh, given though the number of, so the event rates that we estimate for this signal is much higher than the event rates that they know for, for neutron stars. So if you see, so the other thing, the characteristic of the signal is because it's roughly, it's the, the, the energy depend on the binding energy is roughly, there's only modulation of 10% at most around the mass of the axion. So what you would see is a concentration of lines around the mass of the axion. I mean, for, for neutron stars, there is no reason why the lines all appear at the same frequency. <laughs>